Let's begin another week of our four and a half year verse by verse journey through all of God's inspired word by opening to the New Testament book of Acts, chapter number 10, and roll back to verse 34. This is where we left off last session last week. Now, this is a huge watershed event. It's happening probably around 38, maybe 39 at the latest, I think. So a few years after the gospel has been going out. And Peter has been selected by Jesus to go and open the door of salvation to full-fledged Gentiles. Up to this point, the evangelism has all been targeted to ethnic Israelis and any Gentiles who happen to be interested already in the Jewish faith, proselytes as we refer to them, those that are seriously considering becoming Jewish. Well, that's all going to change now. And so you know the story up to this point. Peter has a supernatural vision, followed by a, a word from the Holy Spirit, followed by hearing from Cornelius, his own angelic visitation. And so even though Peter is a little bit concerned that he is standing here in a Gentile home, surrounded by Gentiles, and uh, tells him, you know, tells Cornelius, you understand that that would normally be considered rendering me un unclean. But God has just recently communicated to me that I should never call anyone unclean that God considers clean. And so that's why I'm here. That's why I'm here to give you what you said. God wants you to hear, and that is a word of salvation. So verse 34, let's review this real quickly and then press forward with the story. So Peter opened his mouth and said, truly I understand that God shows no partiality. So no favoritism, no bigotry, no prejudice. But in every nation, every ethnic group is what Peter is actually saying here. Anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. So God is looking for those that want to worship him in spirit and in truth. Verse 36, as for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. Notice the word all there. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the immersion that John proclaimed. So as I said in the previous session, it is pretty clear that Peter believes quite a few of the people in this house were long-term residents of the region and therefore were acquainted with the story, not just simply of Jesus the Christ, but of John the Immerser. Verse 38, how God anointed, that's it. Remember, Peter's talking in Greek here. And so the word here is going to be related to the word for Christ, because Christ in Greek means the anointed one. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are all witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and then in Jerusalem. So the three years of public ministry, which culminates in the events leading up to his death and resurrection. That's what Peter is, is zeroing in on. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us 
who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. That is Peter's parallel to what Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, the definition of gospel, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that's the Jewish scripture, that he was buried and that he was resurrected bodily on the third day according to those same Jewish scriptures. And then he was seen alive by many witnesses, uh, specifically 500 plus people. And then he ascended in the presence of some of those same witnesses. Verse 42, and he commanded us, I think Peter's thinking about the apostles primarily, but it's going to expand outward from there to everyone who knows the gospel. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. So that's a reference to the Great Commission that Peter and the others were told to make disciples of all ethnic groups. That's right there in the wording of Matthew chapter 28. And to teach them, uh, to immerse them, to teach them uh, everything that Jesus told the apostles. So they're supposed to be carrying out this commission. And then verse 43, Peter kind of finishes up before he gets interrupted here. To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone, underline that word everyone there in your mind, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. The name of Jesus in Hebrew, Yehoshua. That's the formal style of it. It means he who is salvation. So Peter says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, the Savior, can receive forgiveness of sins. When Peter first embraced that concept as a, an apostle, I think he really did believe that his focus was supposed to be on ethnic Israelis who would believe and any Gentiles who were already believing and embracing the Jewish faith, the Jewish story from Scripture. But now he is finding out that Jesus meant everyone not just those currently engaged with Judaism. Now, so far we've had God's supernatural in intervention with the great sheet vision for Peter, the Holy Spirit talking to Peter, Cornelius's vision being communicated to Peter. But now we need one last thing to put Peter and the six guys with him who are Jewish, who are probably also quite uh, uncertain about this whole situation, being in a room, uh, a house full of Gentiles that are not even, some of them not even interested uh, in the past in Judaism. And so this is going to push them over the top. Verse 44, while Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter, there's six of them, by the way, were amazed. So they are caught flat-footed. They are shocked because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. Now, this goes back to something that I talked to you before. And that is, there is a distinction between the indwelling gift of the Holy Spirit, which is automatic upon conversion, no supernatural signs and wonders that are attached to the infilling of the Holy Spirit at that point, and the supernatural gifting of the Holy Spirit, 
which does come with supernatural signs and wonders. On the website, intotheword.net, in the PDF section, you will find the Holy Spirit handout that I've done to help illustrate this distinction between uh, the indwelling gift and the supernatural gifting by. What we're seeing here is the supernatural gifting by the Holy Spirit. How do we know that? Because it looks very much like the day of Pentecost. Verse 46, for they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Now, when you go to 1 Corinthians 14, where Paul tackles the topic of tongues, that is the supernatural gift of being able to speak to God in a language not your own, you will see that tongues are not directed to people, but rather to God, and that they become a sign gift. Uh, the apostles on Pentecost did not need the gift of tongues in order to communicate the gospel. They already had the Greek language that they spoke, and everybody spoke Greek. The sign gift of tongues on Pentecost got people's attention and made them go, what? What is this? Uh, these guys are speaking my native dialect, and there's no way in the world that they should be able to do that. And it made the people pay closer attention so that Peter, when he got up and began to preach, the audience was primed to, to hear the word of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ for the very first time. So something similar is happening here. Now, another thing that Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14 is that, th that tongues are a sign for unbelievers, not believers. And what he means by that is it's intended to get the attention of those that are not yet convinced of what they need to believe. And so that's exactly the situation here. Uh, Peter is pretty much on board because of his, his supernatural uh, contacts already on this topic. But we've got six Jewish guys from Joppa that are not yet convinced that this is a good idea. But now they're hearing supernatural speaking in tongues right in their presence. And uh, it's, it's probable in my mind that at least one of the languages being spoken by these Gentiles was Hebrew. I'm talking about ancient Hebrew, Mosaic time Hebrew. Uh, the Jewish people of the Middle East were speaking Aramaic at this time in history for Peter and, and, uh, and uh, the New Testament the book of Acts. Uh, the, the Jewish people had been speaking that ever since uh, the return from the Babylonian and Assyrian exiles. So for the last seven centuries or so. Uh, but Bible Hebrew, that is old Hebrew, was only known uh, through Scripture itself when it was read aloud. It would be kind of similar to uh, some people hearing Latin uh, during a church service. They might understand bits and pieces of it uh, because of their past associations with Latin, uh, but it was not well known to them. So my suggestion to you is that these gentlemen, these Jewish gentlemen, heard Gentiles speaking a language they shouldn't have been able to speak, and that pushed them over the top to understand this is a God thing. So they quit being unbelievers in resisting uh, accepting salvation for Gentiles and became believers in that context. 
How do we know? Because of what comes next. It says, then Peter declared. Now, who's he declaring this to? The six guys that he's with. They're the only Jewish guys there that might object to what he's about to do. So verse 47, can anyone withhold water for immersing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? So Peter asked his six companions, do any of you want to object to the idea of calling these Gentiles to repent of their sins, believe in Jesus as their Savior, be immersed in that name, be immersed into his death and his resurrection, washing away their sins, calling upon the name of the Lord, and becoming followers of Jesus. Because I'm seeing a God thing here. They've got supernatural gifting from the Holy Spirit, just like happened on Pentecost, and just like what happens when apostles lay their hands on people. That is a God thing. And so Peter lays it on pretty heavy that um, they need to immerse these believers in Jesus amongst the Gentiles, regardless of their past association with the Jewish faith. Proselytization is not required for salvation. That's effectively what Peter believes now. And that's going to be important later when we run into the controversy of Judaizing. Uh, I'm going to kind of jump this ahead a little bit. Uh, Once Paul gets up and running as the apostle to the Gentiles, you're going to have an element within the church, a Jewish circumcision party, that's going to insist every Gentile has to become Jewish or they can't embrace Jesus as their Messiah. And Paul will spend an awful lot of time and energy fighting against that. And this is one of the places that show that was never God's intention. So verse 48, he commanded them to be immersed in the name of Jesus Christ, and then they asked him to remain for some days. So we've got the first full-fledged Gentile believers in Jesus. Now, I'm sure that Cornelius embraced Jesus at this time as his Savior, as his Lord, but he was already in the process of proselytizing to Judaism. So he was in a slightly separate category than the pure Gentiles that we really want to focus on here. So Peter and apparently the six uh, guys from Joppa hung around for a bit, uh, rubbing shoulders, so to speak, with Gentiles, which is like a big Jewish no-no, even eating at the in the same house, at the same table, and possibly sharing even the same food dishes. Uh, And I'm talking about both the physical dishes and the menu items. Very, very uh, non-kosher. And this this action of Peter um, may help explain something we already talked about. And that is when John Mark writes down Peter's preaching in what we call the Gospel of Mark now. Uh, In the story in Mark chapter 7, there is an explanatory uh, comment by Mark, but I'm sure it came from Peter first, in that when Jesus said, a man does not become unclean because of what goes in his mouth, but rather what comes out of his heart. Mark 7, 19 says, thus, he, meaning Jesus, declared all foods clean. And so the reality is, not only did Peter learn that Gentiles were acceptable to God and should be treated as brothers and sisters in Christ once they'd embraced 
Jesus as their Messiah and Lord. The food items were also completely on the menu, so to speak, for Jewish people if they wished to do so. Because apparently the whole kosher food thing was a, a, a means of teaching a lesson of following God's directions in the past. Now, all this is great. All this is fantastic. It's great news for those of us that are Gentiles, because now is when we were first welcomed into the faith with open arms. But chapter number 11 tells us not everybody was on board with this. In fact, there were some that were rather ticked off at Peter for doing this. So Acts chapter 11, verse 1. Now, the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. Now, we don't know how many of the 12 apostles were still in the area of Judea at this time, uh, but it's enough that we can use the plural here. Uh, and the brothers that are mentioned here would probably be the leadership uh, within the church at of Judea and the church at Jerusalem. And so these guys hear about the Cornelius event. And uh, now Peter heads back to Jerusalem to be confronted by those that want an explanation. Verse 2, so when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him. Now, this circumcision party is the, the seed stock of the Judaizers we'll run into later. So the circumcision party, perhaps membership comprises somewhat of the Pharisees who eventually embraced Jesus as Messiah. The circumcision party criticized him saying, you went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. So they are concerned, very upset, that Peter crossed kosher lines. He went into the house of an uncircumcised person. He met with a multitude of uncircumcised persons. And not only that, he ate with them in the same house, perhaps at the same table, probably out of the same plates and dishes and bowls, and even the same menu items that were not kosher. And they believe that he crossed the line. Well, let's see what Peter believes. Verse 4, but Peter began and explained it to them in order. So here's his testimony. It's repetitive to us because we've heard the story just recently, but for these guys, it's the first time they heard it straight from him. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, something like a great sheet descending, being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to me. Looking at it closely, I observed animals and beasts of prey and reptiles and birds of the air. Most certainly he means non-kosher animals. And I heard a voice, this is the voice of Jesus, saying, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, By no means, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has ever entered my mouth. So Peter was a very observant Jew. But the voice answered a second time from heaven, What God has made clean, do not call common. So Jesus' message to Peter in this vision, If I say it's kosher, it's kosher. Don't you call anything or anyone unclean if I've told you they are not. And so this happened three times, and everybody understood that Peter had a thing about the number three now, and all was drawn up again into heaven. And behold, at that very moment, three men arrived at the house in which we were, sent to me from Caesarea. 
and the Spirit told me to go with them, making no distinction. So he testifies not just simply to the vision he had, but also to the Holy Spirit telling him, I don't want you to treat these guys differently than anyone else of importance. I sent them, you go with them. Verse 12 continues, These six brothers also accompanied me. So it's interesting, Peter was probably anticipating this problem. So he brings the six guys from Joppa who were at Caesarea with him up to Jerusalem to bear witness to the supernatural event that comes next. So these six brothers also accompanied me. We entered the man's house. And he told us how he'd seen the angel stand in his house and say, send to Joppa and bring Simon, who's called Peter. He'll declare to you a message by which you will be saved, you and all your household. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them, just as on us at the beginning. And then I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John immersed with water, but you will be immersed with the Holy Spirit. And then Peter, having told the whole story, with all the supernatural elements of it, throws it into the court of these guys. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? That's a challenge. I was not going to tell God no. Are you? When they heard these things, they fell silent. Now, some of them will start griping again later, but right now they're shutting up because how do you object to God's activity? And then they, and I think these are the better ones amongst the group, they glorified God saying, then the Gentiles, to the Gentiles, God has also granted repentance that leads to life. And you can tell from it, they are amazed by this reality. 